Uh, my name is Setsuko Thurlow, originally from Hiroshima, but have been living here in Toronto for many years. My second home. Now, I grew, I was born in 1932. I was raised there. I lived there until I finished university and then came to the United States on scholarship. Um, um, the first 15 years of my life, I grew up in a very militaristic, fascist, uh, totalitarian social milieu. Um, I didn't know any other way, but um, life wasn't that bad. Uh, we couldn't have everything we wanted, good food, good candy, chocolate, and pretty clothes, and things were restricted. But in the early part of my childhood, uh, it was uh, pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, I think of nice, large, sunny garden. My father loved gardening, and we employed the gardener who was there most of the time. I became good friends with the gardener. He taught me everything about trees and plants and flowers and how to pick the fruits and so on. So in earlier memories, those are the happy. And uh, lots of people were coming to our house. Uh, 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 my father was kind of acting as the head of the family clan, according to the old system. And that meant uh, lots of uh, uh, religious or familiar events, activity took place at my place whether it's a memorial service of the deceased or wedding of the cousins and so on. Everything was happening in that place. So I have a happy recollection on that part of the childhood. Well, one memory I cannot forget is that uh, the gardener used to wrap each bud of the peonies, you see, in late May. And I asked him, what are you doing? He said, well, just wait till this weekend and you'll see. And sure enough, he came back. He started taking all the thin rice paper, which he used to cover up. He took all the cover. So all the peonies in the garden just suddenly, fully. Wow. <laughs> and the guests started arriving. That's the kind of happiness, I remember. Uh -huh. Then, and Japan declared the war. Japan did a rather stupid thing, attacking Pearl Harbor in such a way. And uh, the lifestyle suddenly had to be changed. Um, for a while, Japan was doing well, they were sinking so many American ships and, and so forth. But soon, Japan started losing ships and the planes and the men fighting and so on. So, the, our lifestyle changed quickly. Every day on the radio, the instruction come, and now we'll uh, ration rice, was ration this, ration that, and, and the life became very constricted and uh, sad. Mm -hmm. uh, but we were brainwashed, you see. Mm -hmm. We were descendants of the emperor. Uh -huh. Uh, the sons and the son daughters of the goddess, uh -huh. and we would never lose in war. Uh -huh. And uh, as a little girl, I believed it like everybody else. Sure. 
So things started changing, like uh, the elementary school changed the name of the school itself, people schools and things like that. Every morning we have to go, we couldn't have heavy warm coat, we froze. In. And our house was ordered to be destroyed, at least half of it, because they have to widen the street in order for the vehicles and the trains and all that kind of thing. They have to send the men and the, the supplies to the war. So the widening the road was one of the very popular activities. So that meant our house, our own house, had to be made half size. I had to give that up. And so we moved to another connecting house. My father had many houses, rental houses. And we moved. And the, the house which was cut short and became the hotel. Hotel to accommodate Japanese men who are being shipped to the battlefield. You see, they were being recruited from all over Japan. They were brought to Hiroshima and spent the last night in Japan and get on the boat from, from Hiroshima Harbor. And then, so they were spending the last day of their life in Japan. So even as a little kid, I knew what that meant. You know, they left their children and the wives and so on. And they were having the little sake and having a party last night. Well, that just stays in my mind because my own house became to accommodate the Japanese men who were enjoying the last night of their life. Anyway, uh, in the spring of 1945, the air raids started badly. Well, even before they were coming just to investigate what's down there, but I think they were ready. Now, after they captured the Tinian and Tinian Island in the Pacific, that was a good location. The plane could just fly over to Japan in one hop, start attacking the cities. So that was the beginning of the indiscriminate attack of civilians, starting in Tokyo and Osaka, Nagoya, all the major cities. I understand more than 100 urban centers had been burned out. So we are wondering when it's going to be our turn. Hiroshima was considered to be the 10th largest city at that time. But even the smaller city had been bombed. How come? Nothing is happening. Well, plane keep coming back every day, but they don't drop the bomb. Why not? What's going on? And all kinds of rumors spread. Uh, little did we know that U.S. was keeping Hiroshima intact for special purpose. Because by then, Mr. Truman had the information in his pocket. They were successful with the first testing of the bomb in July. And uh, he or his military man sent the message, don't attack Hiroshima. Well, you can easily guess if you want to test the new type of bomb you want to have uh, you want to attack the city mm -hmm. intact rather than already nothing but the rocks and ashes so we didn't know that until much later and we were very anxious so we were going to school uh, with the special instruction with uh, special headgear 
uh, in case of uh, attack, we have to put that on. We are always carrying the bag filled with the guards and all the medical supplies and even some food like roasted beans and something. So, uh, so oh, such speedy change in a lifestyle. And guess what? <laughs> I was meeting my students at the station. That very morning, I collected them and said, we would start the march to the army headquarter. And I would say, well, it's, it's March, and then we get to the gate of the army headquarters. I'd say, Kashira, meet the, the head right. You know, you have to greet. So even the little girls of 13 was acting like a little Japanese soldier. You have to behave that way. Anyway, uh, I was a grade 8 student. Uh, grade seven, yes, we had almost regular lessons at schools. Like I learned English, this is a pen. This is a pen. We kept changing, and that's how I learned English, and that was fun. But uh, the second year, grade eight, yeah, we, we hardly had the regular classroom instruction. Uh, we were sent to the farmers and to help farm and the, the company where we packed the tobacco, the cigarette box we sent to the front line to help. Uh, another time we went to uh, the military factory where we produce the clothing for the um, make sure the buttons are at the right place for the military men. And then uh, several weeks before the bombing of Hiroshima, I think it must have been about April or May 1945, um, I was selected to be one of about the 30 girls who was sent to army headquarters to learn how to decode secret messages. Um, that was fun. We learned it quickly. And on August 6th, that very day, that was supposed to be the very first day for us to act as an official uh, assistant to the army. And uh, shall I continue talking about uh, on that day, I met the girls at the station. We marched, and um, nearby headquarter, and I took them to the second floor of the huge building, the wooden building, which was located about one mile from the ground zero. And at 8 o'clock, we started the morning uh, assembly. Major Yanai was g giving us, about 30 girls, the pep talk. You have been trained well. This is the very day you start demonstrating your, you know, lo loyalty and da 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 to the emperor. We said, yes, sir, we will do our best. At that moment, I saw in the window uh, the tremendous flush. Oh, somebody said the, the flush or the light brighter than the sun. And somebody said, well, th tens of thousands of sun burst together. But anyway, I did see that and I couldn't comprehend. But before you had a chance to comprehend what was happening, I knew my body was flying up in the air. I knew I was floating in the air. That is the last sensation I remember. After that, I lost consciousness. Now, when I regained the consciousness in the total darkness and uh, silence, I knew, finally, 
Americans got us. You see, people in Hiroshima were anxiously wondering why we hadn't been attacked when everybody else had been attacked. But uh, even I realized this must have been done by the U.S. I couldn't move my body, so I knew I faced death. But I wasn't panic-stricken at all. I calmly accepted that. Then I started hearing the girls' faint voices. Mother, I'm here. Help me. God, help me. So I knew I was not alone in that darkness. I was surrounded. Then all of a sudden, strong hand touched me from behind. Don't give up. Don't give up. Keep moving. I'm trying to free you. You see the light coming from that opening and move toward it as quickly as possible. Now, I'm trying to free you. Come on, keep cooking, keep pushing, keep kicking. So he was tearing me up and then we struggled and some, finally he was able to free me. So desperately I did what he suggested. By the time I came out, the building was on fire. When I came out, I turned back and try to determine what the situation was like, if I could go back and help my girlfriend. But no, I couldn't get into that. It was. Then I looked around. I thought strange. Also, it happened at 8:15 in the morning. It was dark, dark like twilight. And then. I began to see in the dark some moving objects moving around. But they were so silent, so quiet. Nobody was screaming and yelling and, you know, asking for help and running around. No, it was a ghostly stillness. That's a very spooky picture I still remember. Then those moving objects come closer to me and I look at them. Uh, it, to me, it was a procession of ghostly figures. They didn't look like human beings. The hair was standing up and all curled up and skin and flesh were just falling out. Some were carrying the eyeballs in their hands, and many just went like this, the skin and the flesh hanging. They were slowly shuffling toward outside of the city, from the center part of the city. And uh, soldiers said, since I was at the army headquarters, there must be lots of soldiers and officers a lot killed but a lot survived and uh, somebody said you girls join that procession and escape to a nearby hill so that's what we did we carefully stepped over the dead body on the ground and that silence continued but we heard voice, fainting voice. Everybody was asking for water. Water, please, water. Uh, by the time we got to the foot of the hill, um, the place was packed with the dead bodies and dying people. Well, there was some um, training ground at the foot of the hill, and which was the size of two football fields put together. 
And by the time we got there, the place was packed with the dead bodies and dying people. And they kept begging for water. We three girls, well, we were covered with the blood and so on, but we are not seriously injured. Well, we wanted to help, but we had no bucket, no knock, no cups to carry the water. So we went to the nearby and washed our body and uh, tore our blouses, soaked them in the water. And then we take this soaked clothes over the mouth of the dying people <laughs> who sucked in the moisture. That was the only thing they were able to get before die. Imagine three, four thousand degrees Celsius. That's the heat of the bomb on the ground level. And that burned them inside out. Mm. They must have been suffering so much. Everybody was asking nothing but the water. Mm. The, yeah, so only a few people were able to get some, you know, moisture. Mm. No doctors, no nurses around. Mm. Oh, on that very day, I looked around. And I thought, surely, um, healthcare professionals must be around. But I didn't see one single healthcare professional where tens of thousands are dying. Well, about 80, 90 percent of the healthcare professionals were also killed, and those who survived were working at a different area, not where I was. Uh, Well, I think the majority of people were just crushed, and the, the death caused by the crushed building and the burnt. And, uh, but the people who are not burnt, like me, were there. So I was exposed to radiation. So in the Aftermath, well, maybe before I talk about the aftermath, let me tell you a few things about what happened that day. My schoolmates, the majority of my schoolmates, were working in the center part of the city. The grade seven and eight students from all the high schools of the city were brought to that place because the city had a special plan. They wanted to destroy all the buildings and widen the street to be ready for the young. So that's the kind of work they do. So all the young kids and the boys took shirts off right under the detonation. They are the first one who simply vaporized, melted. From my school, over 300 students were there. I'm alive because I wasn't there. I was somewhere else, far, you know, one mile away. I was inside a building. I was buried by the collapsed building. I must have been protected. But those people had no protection directly under. 4,000 degrees Celsius heat, just carbonized vaporized and uh, one of the girls survived and, sh and she came back and told us what happened to the girls before they died they just scrolled around and they couldn't identify each other because they were so black and swollen but by voice they could call each other they sat together in a circle. They sat, they sang him, I understand. And particularly the, the beautiful one, my favorite, Shuyo Mimoto ni Chikazukan. In English, it's something like, Lord, I am coming near you. 
something like that. And as they sang together, one by one just collapsed and died. This is what happened to my classmates. Because one girl survived and came back and told us the story. Mm. I know the story. And my own sister-in-law was a teacher. She was directing, supervising activities of those people. We tried to find her body. We never found. So she left the two little children as often. In, in the Let me see. Yeah. So those are the people who had some tangible evidence of uh, injury, either burnt skin or swollen face or whatnot. But there are a lot of people in the city or in the outskirts. They looked all right. For example, my uncle and aunt, when we heard they survived, we rejoiced. But a week later, they started feeling so sick. They started vomiting on, and they started having purple spots all over the body. And that was a sure sign they are going to die. Indeed, they died. So in those days, we survivors, first thing we did in the morning was to check every part of the body, make sure we would live another day. That's the kind of anxiety we lived with. Um, now, long term, well, in, in the immediate aftermath, oh, people just felt so lethargic, even if you didn't have any tangible evidence of suffering, just, just didn't have energy. And uh, some people just complain about the survivors, and uh, they are useless, uh, they don't work, they can't work. So if the farmer wants to employ them or don't employ them, they don't work because they are not physically capable of doing that. And a lot of people suffered with a scar, a very bad scar. They, look, they didn't look nice. So some thoughtless people started calling them all oh, their ghosts and so on. Social alienation, yeah. And discrimination was real. So those girls with that kind of, um, no, they lost the opportunity for equal treatment for anything, employment, marriage, housing, and whatnot. So it was not just the physical damage, but the social, psychological, in every way. The city just dis disappeared. The unthinkable happened. Japan never thought we would lose in war. We did. And uh, we had to survive, day-to-day -day survival. We were starving. Uh, I have the great respect for women who were determined to keep their families fed. Where did they find the food? But anyway, city, some officials, mayors or officials who survived, they immediately start working, uh, contacting the military outfits if there are some clothing left and some food left and try to uh, distribute them to the starving people. But you know, for 12 years, central government, national government, didn't lift a finger to help us. Of course, I can say uh, they were uh, totally disoriented because they are the one who firmly believed we are the descendant and the emperor and all that, the myth. And they were totally immobilized. And they couldn't think of the poor suffering people. They had to know what to do. Anyway, uh, 
But still, that's no excuse, though. For 12 <coughs> years, if only government was able to help the survivors by giving blankets, for example, give some advice not to sleep on the contaminated ground in the city and so on, not information given, no help for blankets or food given. So the survivors who didn't have friends and relatives outside the city just slept on that contaminated ground. The other, once again, the first one who went, in my case, it was, we were so fortunate and I almost feel badly for when I think of the people who had no choice. Well, we went to the outside of the city where my uncle welcomed us, fed us, housed us, and clothed us because he himself lost two two daughters, they, ne they never came back from the city. And three boys were fighting out there, it's China or somewhere. He was alone with the wife of his eldest son, so he had lots of space and lots of food. So he took us in. But the survivors had to escape out of the city, and uh, the farther away they go in Japan, the less information the people had about this new type of the bomb. The communication system was so poor at that time, and the system was broken up. Yeah. So uh, the, he said, oh, who are they, those ghostly figures? So the social discrimination was real. Now, later on, the United States established something called ABCC, Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So people were so happy. Finally, we were going to get some medical attention, medical supply. But no, the sole purpose of those was to study the effect of, effect of radiation on human body, but not to give supply or help, medical help. When people found that out, you can imagine, they felt, oh, they are simply using us as guinea pig first by testing on us and now studying us as a medical, you know, as a subject of the medical research. So the United States must be pre preparing for the future events similar to this. That was infuriating and the people, of course, very angry. That happened under the leadership of um, General MacArthur, who became the supreme commander of the Allied forces after Jap Japan surrendered. <laughs> the person we consider as God and God's descendant just disappeared somewhere else. He was no longer. It was uh, MacArthur who made a clear statement to us, to Japanese, that I came to Japan to achieve two things. One was to demilitarize Japan, and secondly, to democratize Japan. Great. I think many of us, many of the people were relieved that the war ended. After all, we had suffered from war 15 years. I grew up without knowing, you know, um, just knowing the war time. So democracy, what is democracy like? Uh, what is it supposed to be? And we were anxious to learn. And we learned, well, the woman can be treated equally as a man. Great news. You see, I was a student at the girls' 
the Christian school, private school. Uh, so that was the beginning of my very happy post-war period. I was at the school where they kept telling us the time has changed. Women can equally be active in society. And a lot of encouragement was given to do that. And uh, the new building was built in the center of the city, and that was the very first one. And uh, American teachers started coming back to Hiroshima, and, and I had lots of good ideas, like starting the uh, newspapers for the high school girls. And, and I became the president of the biggest uh, student club, the YWCA, we called. And, uh, and uh, the boys' school, University of Hiroshima, they too had the YMCA. We jointly, until then, we never worked with the stu male student. But for the first time, we could have activities together. And that was a very refreshing experience. So I think around that time, I think uh, activism mm -hmm. um, uh, was being formed. We did a lot of work. Uh, yes, uh, in Tokyo YWCA leader was running uh, for parliament, I think. We got the news and we were very proud. We wanted to support. Can you imagine young me helping with the election, making speeches for her and riding on the truck and so on. And I enjoyed it very much. It was a happy time. But on the other side of my life at that time was a pretty serious one. Uh, having experienced the, the total chaos, sudden disappearance of the envi environment you're used to, you begin to wonder, what is this about? How come this happened? Mm -hmm. Well, at the school they talk about love of God. The Christians are supposed to love each other, but it was a Christian country, United States, which did something like this. My mind was full of questions, and I took this seriously. I wasn't just happily editing the students' newspaper, you know. No, I spent a lot of time, I, I guess, I went to school early in the morning before everybody comes, and we had a special prayer room and where we could have the one-to-one -one dialogue with the teacher and said, what? So I raised questions, and the teachers were very responsive. Mm -hmm. They knew what struggle we were having emotionally spiritually, psychologically, and uh, I really give the real credit to those dedicated teachers. After all, I spent 10 years from junior high, senior high, university, 10 years in that environment with a supportive, sensitive, empowering teacher and they listened to our struggle. We were totally lost. And uh, about four years of debate within myself, with the mentors and f friends, this is what I want to do. And I joined the Christian church. The most, I think, the activism of 
Christian church. The emphasis of serving fellow man. Uh, that was very important to me. Not just to ourselves, but we worked together in the community. For example, at that time, I was in high school. I read the annual report of World Council of Churches. Mm -hmm. And uh, I happened to read uh, one definition. It said, "Peace is not the absence. Peace is not only the absence of war, but it's the struggle to ensure justice to all people, something like that. As I remember, in those days, we never used the word social justice. Now we use it, but not in those days. And then also it said to, to give or to provide to all people. All people, that was important. Not, not, not segregating the uh, rich or poor and were better educated and not educated. Because if in Japan in those days, there was some kind of uh, system. Like I come from samurai mm -hmm. uh, family, not about the commoner, that kind of thing. Just here we're talking about all the people. Mm -hmm. Communist or people who them? Well, I wasn't sure what the World Council of Churches is, but I was interested in learning more about Christianity. I guess every chance I had, I went to library reading their publication, and just happened to see, hey, this is a great idea. Yes, peace, not just the absence of war. No, that is easy to understand. But say, to all people, you mean without discrimination, to all people, equality, wow. And uh, what did I say? The social justice, what does that mean? What does that include? Equality and, you know, and human rights and so on. We never knew what the human rights was. So this kind of stimuli was always making me question. And I was always going to teach us, what does this mean? What does this mean? And I was full of questions. And I'm glad I was. And I asked, and I got a lot. And this is why I decided, OK, this is the way I am going to live. Now, you see, shortly before the bombing took place, the city decided all the elementary school kids, uh, grade f five up, have to be evacuated from the city mm -hmm. because we were anticipating the attack. So th those 5,000 kids were moved out of the city. So the war ended, they came back to the city. There was no city. Mm -hmm. There was no house. There were no parents. 5,000 kids without central government's help. How do they survive? They started running around on the, in the ashes and the rubbles N near the black market. Mm -hmm. learning how to earn a few yen, pick pickpocket, on that kind of petty criminal activities. Well, my church minister was one of those people who were there to try to do some help. 
to those kids. Um, raise money and, uh, and uh, start the orphanages here and there. And also there are a lot of families where the fathers and sons never came home from the war. The woman had to feed the babies and the children. Amazing mm -hmm. strength a woman have. But they had no place to live and so on. So not just the orphan, orphanages, but the women's homes, just about any basic need, human needs have to be met. And the people who are convinced of their responsibility just kept themselves busy. And my church minister was one of those. And he was criticized by many people. You're church minister, your job is to stay in your study and prepare a sermon for next Sunday kind of thing. Even among the Christian church, yeah, the even from among the congregation, yeah, I, I hear. I was so proud. He said, well, Christian faith without action, it's not worth talking about. He always emphasized love mm -hmm. and action. So I was watching how adults work in the aftermath of that society, how, how they work influenced younger, growing children to respond to the so-called crisis situation. You don't have to talk much. You just have to act. Then we watch and we know what's right and this is the way I want to live and so on. So by the time I graduated from college, I knew what field I wanted to go on. I wanted to be a social worker. Mm -hmm. So I said to the president, who was a graduate of Columbia University, and, um, and she said, you know, let's go. Now the time has changed. Women can do uh, important things. And uh, you go and learn about the group work, group leadership. We need to help women in this city. Go and study this and that. Come back and be provide the leadership for women in Hiroshima. What? To be a social worker, you have to go to university? Just with a good will, anybody can do that. Yes, anybody can. But there are new way of thinking. And you can study theory and the practice and so on. You can be more effective. So, with that kind of discussion, the opportunity for me to get the scholarship to come to the United States and study. That's why, yeah. But I must tell you, that was 1950, no, 1954, I graduated. And that was a very important year for us. American had been testing hydrogen bomb, but on March 1st, I think, in 1954, the Americans tested the largest hydrogen bomb at the Bikini Atoll in mm -hmm. Marshall Islands. And that created a fury and because many fishing boats were around and the Americans claimed they received the warning, but uh, there were a lot of them. And one of them was Japanese and uh, one fisherman died. All the crew members who covered the, the um, radioactive. Uh, and so an entire Japan woke up. And not only Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but now Bikini, look how destroying the environment and the people are 
showing the similar kind of symptom as our people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki did. United States, this is unforgivable. And that time, the entire Japan woke up to the reality. You see, communication system was not so good at that time. And uh, MacArthur was reigning us, and everybody was kind of, uh, you know, yeah. And then there was quite a bit of uh, oppression. So people were not that free. Mm -hmm. Even the press were not free to write about. So uh, they couldn't care less at this time. They just <coughs> blew up. The, that was the beginning of the biggest, biggest uh, social action mm -hmm. in Jap Japan's history. And that's the summer I took a boat from Japan, spent two weeks on that, that Pacific, it's not Pacific Ocean, it's Kuro Ocean. And uh, I got to, to the state and I arrived in Virginia where I was to study. And uh, media people knew what was happening in the Pacific, how upset the Japanese were. And here's a Hiroshima survivor coming. And uh, they immediately, immediately asked me what I felt about that. So what else can I? I said, testing have to stop. Destroying the environment has to stop. And the people injured have to be cared. And the people in Japan are still suffering, that dying from leukemia and all kinds of cancers. I said negative thing to them. Then, next day, I started getting uh, hate letters, mm -hmm. unsigned hate letters. That was the beginning, and that was the introduction to American yeah. life. And they told me, who started the Pearl Harbor? Go home. But I just arrived. I couldn't go back. Uh, can I live here in this country? How am I going to survive here? Do I pretend? Uh, I saw nothing. I know nothing and not, no experience. Put the zipper over my mouth. It was a traumatic experience. I couldn't go to the school. I mean, I couldn't go to the classroom. I couldn't concentrate. So I stayed in the professor's home all by myself for a whole week. And I prayed and suffered, thought, and, and it, it was the loneliest time. But uh, in reflection, I feel that was an important time that gave me the opportunity to really do the soul searching what is the value for my life? What is the purpose? Well, my job is to share my experience in Hiroshima and what it means to live in nuclear age, what horror that brings to humanity, and we should never, ever let that happen again to another human being. That's my message, and I can't stop talking about it. I am going to keep talking. That was the decision. In reflection, how could I do that? You know, alone, mm -hmm. I was able to do that. I'm grateful. And I desperately started the reading um, yeah, people's um, articles. And the one person whose writing influenced me very much is Professor Richard Falk, uh -huh. F-A-L-K. He was an international law specialist at uh, Princeton, Princeton University, of course. And I started reading it. 
Oh, I was so happy because I felt so alone. And Americans don't feel, look at that as I do. But here's a man who supports my idea. And I, so when I met him, when I corresponded with him, how he rescued me, he really empowered me. Yeah, we correspond now. Yes, he's living on the West Coast now. So I met hundreds of those very thought-provoking leaders, and they helped me. No such luck. No. I, have, I met him on the screen. Yes. Yes. I have been to his school, yeah. But, yeah, I know I'm jumping all over the place, but uh, roughly, this is the so kind. That, well, I guess so conscious, formally. Conscious. Yeah, I think I started acting. Although, the need for our dedication, the commitment, I think I felt that much earlier when I was in Hiroshima yes. because it was it turned to be a city of peace and everybody was for peace and as the cenotaph was built and so on we all made the commitment we made the vow after all all of loved ones and the friends classmates I can't just live the kind of, the, we'll make sure that your death was not meaningless. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, well, that's what I always feel when I made the last speech at the United Nations on that day when they voted for the treaty. Uh, for many years, I have been doing so-called disarmament education, speaking to young people or civic people like Rotary Club and the Women's Club and so on. I've been doing it, but then gradually I started the getting invitation to the international conference, UN conference and so on. And I think it was 2007, was it? Uh, the physicians group in Ottawa invited me, please come. We are having the inaugural meeting of the group. We are going to call it ICANN. Um, uh, it didn't, yeah. I thought that would be another big group, but I wasn't thinking of. Anyway, so uh, lots of politicians and lots of doctors, lots of medical students from nearby university. And the place was at the parliament building inside. And I was to be the speaker. So I told them uh, something of my personal experience. And then the humanitarian, after all, it's a people who suffer. And this has been forgotten in our debate. They're always talking about <laughs> strategies and d deterrence uh, and all that kind of thing. So I emphasize the humanity at risk and that some um, medical professionals, their job is to serve humanity. Anyway, I did speak, but at that time I never thought that small group would be the huge global. I never did have that. But anyway, that was the beginning. And then I went to Nayarit uh, in India, and I met members of ICANN, and I was astounded. I told them when they just asked me for spontaneous speech. I said, you know, I have been working many, many years 
as a survivor, sharing my experience and my aspirations and my desires and dreams and so on. And uh, at the most of the meetings, a lot of people with the white hair and middle age and so on. But here, wow, a lot of young people and such a passionate, energetic, creative, and well-informed too, very studied mind, and so committed. And I was so excited. And uh, I think I must have shared that the feeling of joy. That was a surprise to me, a very pleasant surprise. And I have made several trips after that to Germany or England or other parts of Europe. But young people come. I go to medical school and I was that in Berlin, yeah. Well, some didn't know anything about the issue, but some started studying it and so eager to learn. It was a tremendously empowering experience to realize, finally, some people of the world are not avoiding it. They want to learn, to find out what kind of world they are living in, what would be their responsibility. That gave me hope. Really. So I enjoyed the working with those people. At that moment, my mind was not functioning normally, almost numb. Did I hear it right? Do I? Am I seeing it right? I have to convince myself. It took time. And then I took my glasses off, shut my eyes. And the tears just started running, falling. Finally realizing what it means. And the first thing which came to my mind was to share this great news with all those loved ones who would have loved to hear it. I did that in my prayer. Tears. So I was behind the people. My psyche was not functioning in a normal way, but I caught up. Unforgettable moment. Tell me about the Nobel Prize. Right oh. here, uh -huh. this place was with the Japanese journalists uh -huh. and photographer. <sighs> it's not crazy. And that telephone is over there. If anything should happen, that telephone would ring. So they wanted me to sit there so they can take a picture of me receiving it. I said, no, that won't happen. But well, we have to be ready just in case. So that's what happened at about 6 o'clock in the morning, I think. Well, we realized nothing wrong. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. N n no, that telephone didn't ring. But other people had the thing, you see. Hey, I can got it. <laughs> oh, the big, big row here. Yeah. Fantastic. And somebody took a crazy picture of me. I'm going, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Japanese journalist took that. Yeah. Anyway, um, International Steering Committee of the ICANN, right? And um, they held a conference, right? And uh, Beatrice, executive director, uh, uh, to go. But apparently, they, everybody decided that I should be there uh, sharing the lecture. 
Oh, I haven't really had the chance to discuss with them why and so on. I just can guess, but uh, anyway, uh, not one person opposed. Everybody thought that was appropriate that they should invite me to share that glorious moment together. So, yes, I went. Now, are you asking my experience in Oslo? Well, of course I was tense, but physically I was not very well, mm. but I didn't know it. Mm. Only after I came back, the doctor told me, hey, we have to operate on you right away. So I had two operations, two hospitalizations over here. No wonder I was not feeling peppy when I was over there. But anyway, um, I don't know. They treat you like a queen, no? You arrive yes. at the airport, there's the limousine, there's yes. the, the star treatment. Yes, deputy chair of the Nobel Committee came to the airport to meet me or something. All this, you know, you, yeah. Amazing. Yes, and I sat with Queen and King at the dinner and Yes, I wish I was more wide awake and observed everything. I didn't get maybe 75% of what's happening. Well, I would like to see this treaty to go, to go, to enter effect. Is that how you yep. say it? To enter effect. We have many more countries we have to convince. So that is the immediate goal, I think all of us are working. Um, I'll be making a trip to Japan next month, and uh, I'll be doing a lot of speaking with the people and uh, some politicians as well, like prime minister and foreign minister and so on. I would. I am ready to meet with anybody. And I want to convince them if they are willing to listen. And lots of uh, press interviews and so forth is organized. So that would be a good opportunity to speak my mind. I really feel that Japan should be providing leadership which it hasn't done just because of their um, relationship with the United States. And I think it's so cowardly thing to do. Uh, what they say and what they do are two different things. Well, politically, they have to say, and domestically, Oh, we are the only nuclear weapon bombed nation, therefore we have the moral responsibility to provide leadership towards disarmament. That's what they say for political reasons. But when they come to White House or Pentagon here, no. All he does is just bow, yes sir, how high sir, mm -hmm. total subservience. And uh, people just don't have the faith, trust in that kind of relationship. Speaking different things from both ends of the mouth, I think. So, if you have a bright idea, give me. <laughs> I, just, I just have to speak as a human being who experienced it. What I think, after all, we're talking about human beings. And that's where our focus and attention have to be put. And they're not thinking that way, no. Well, I'll ask what they mean. Why do they think it's too difficult? Who said so? Where did you hear that kind of thing? Yes, oh, that's a huge assumption you're making. Well, men made it. 
we should be able to get rid of it. We have that kind of scientific. I think there is one particular thing. I, I talked to you about the uh, atomic bomb casualty commission, which yes. was only to study the effect of radiation on human bodies, but not to offer the treatment or medication or anything. I made it clear, yes. yes. That was... That was barbaric. Hmm? That was barbaric. Bob. Yeah, I know, totally. And that was uh, about the, a year late after the experience. Another thing I have to tell you, uh, I think I told you that uh, General MacArthur said we want to achieve two things, uh, demilitarization, de democratization. Great, sounds great. And he did do some great things, such as uh, to give women the vote. That's great. Or uh, help the labor union to be active. The financial uh, system, educational system, some reform took place. That's great. But as far as Hiroshima and Nagasaki were concerned, he did totally opposite of democratization. This is what he did. He did not wish the human suffering caused by those bombs <coughs> be understood by the world. For that, he had to... Uh, since he, he introduced the censorship. The press were not free to write about human suffering, about how triumphant, what kind of triumphant, uh, the scientific triumphant, you know, uh, they had by developing powerful bomb like that. That was okay. You can talk many times. But about human suffering, it caused, was not to be written. And some newspaper have written, and they were closed. Mm -hmm. they, their work was terminated. You don't write about Hibaksha, the suffering people, because the United States did not wish the backlash from the rest of the world. And from their own taxpayer too, oh, yeah. True. And not only that, they started confiscating personal things among the survivors. Some people kept the diaries, mm -hmm. or the pictures, photographs, slides, uh, all kinds. Of, you know, Japanese write the poems and. A long one and short one and so on. When they were suffering, you know, having lost everything, what's there? Their heart is filled. Their thoughts have to come out. The only thing they could do was keep the diary and make the poem. That was their way of healing. But those things were too dangerous. They were all confiscated, 32,000 items and all, and they were shipped back to Washington. No. So those are two concrete examples I give you. The whole development of the nuclear age, not only weapon system, but psychological, sociological preparation came together with it. Incredible testimony. So, if only I don't have to be traveling around and speaking. Actually, I want to sit, just read and write. Actually, that's what I want to do from now on because I have mobility problem. I enjoy writing. So much more to be shared with the world.